with a really great panel. I know that'll um, get everybody going. So we're starting with a panel uh, called Adopting New Building Technology. It drives into the nitty gritty of optimizing new building technologies to drive value. Our moderator comes to us from a global leader in energy management. It's his job to make sure our buildings, our infrastructure, and our mission critical facilities are as smart as the vehicles we drive. Please welcome our moderator from Schneider Electric, Mark Miller, along with our panel, and he'll do the panel introduction. So everyone, please come on up to the stage, and let's kick this thing off. Give him a round of applause, guys. All right, so we'll go, I guess, from down the line, if you can. Uh, just give your brief overview of who you are and uh, what your roles and responsibilities are, please. Sure. I'm uh, Mike Taglione. I'm the co-founder of Thrux. It is a MEP design environment based in New York City. Um, so what we do is provide a suite of tools for MEP engineers to design buildings, and uh, on top of that, translate those, those designs to cost. Also, my name's... Uh, Spelled a little bit incorrectly up there, so just don't, don't mind that. I'm David Epps. I'm the director of construction technology for winter construction out of Atlanta here. So I'm um, essentially a professional nerd in construction. I oversee laser scanning, drones, AR, VR, BIM, BDC, you name it. Um, kind of comes to my department, and we support all of our construction projects using all that technology. Good morning, everyone. I'm Riti Gupta. I'm the director of practice technology at HKS. Again, we are a small unit of people who are all up for technology and uh, service. Our entire firm of about 1,400 people um, for areas in BIM, VR, AR, um, and a lot of building performance analysis tools as well. Uh, so anything that overlaps the processes and workflows for innovation and improvement comes our way. Thank you. And Michael, your name is misspelled. I'm not even up there. So uh, you, you've got one step up on me, Mac Astorga. I've been recruited late, perhaps. Um, I'm from AECOM, an, another AEC company, global. I lead innovation, uh, company, a, a, a subset of AECOM called AECOM Ventures. We're essentially an in-house technology incubator. Um, so our business crosses, if you're not familiar with AECOM, you know, kind of largely civil, uh, vertical design, and then we have a large construction business as well. Okay, perfect. So I think technology is a very broad subject, so it means a lot of different things to not just the people in the audience, but to everybody on the stage. I think from you know, a Schneider standpoint, we're traditionally more of a product-focused organization with some software technologies. We have construction, which is the implementation of some of those technologies, and then technology providers like um, like the other two. So, you know, from, from my standpoint, how do you assess new technologies? How do you figure out, okay, this is something we want to pursue, this is something that we want to uh, utilize, or, you know, for, for Michael, you, this is something that I want to invest in and develop myself and further the cause. So, I guess, you know, since we started with Michael, we'll go with Mac real quick off the, in the beginning here. And Sure, um, Mark, you know, so, you know, I'd say we'd look at it from two ways. Um, you know, for our startups in the audience, you know, we, we, from one perspective, you know, obviously it depends on who, uh, what part of the vertical you're looking at for us, but on the design side, for example, or on the construction side, you know, think about us. We don't sell products. You know, we're a service provider, uh, you know, and, and uh, not to be too obvious, but we're a low, mar you know, it's, that's a low margin business. So we don't have a tremendous amount of money like a product company made to invest in innovation. So, Ours is largely trying to drive efficiencies often, particularly that's the technologies we're seeing now. So we measure an investment uh, or a, a new technology based on a return on that. And for us as a service provider, 
it's based on efficiencies gained and it's how we would invest BD dollars. So, you know, it's a 20 to one or a 30 to one kind of look at how we look at investments. So it's, you know, speaking to us, I look for internal investments, but when we're looking externally, it's one way that we look at how we first consider utilizing a new technologies is how do we compensate the return from efficiencies gained. So that's an internal look and then externally, you know, which you all have to deal with. In reality, being a service provider, we're at some times, particularly in construction, at the whim of the owner. So we also have to look at new technologies on what our owner is attempting to, 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 to achieve with their construction of their project, what pro things they've used in the past. So, you know, it's, it's for us, we have to look at it in two lenses. Right. So we're also an architecture and design company, so it's uh, also very much similar to what Max uh, mentioned here, that we do have to understand what efficiencies we are bringing in with the different technologies and tools we're rolling out. Um, we basically try to put a conscious effort in understanding what is out there in the market, what technologies are being adopted uh, more recently, and also look internally for our uh, own staff as to what they need to be provided with. And we go through a rigorous effort of matching um, the needs of our uh, firm uh, based on our strategic plan and based on where we are headed to see what's out there and figure out the right roadmap to be implemented in the next year, for example. Um, a lot of new staff coming in, we identified the immediate need to uh, find better solutions for training. Um, and also uh, the whole uh, data aspect of our files that we work on, we want to be able to capture that and uh, kind of weave through different um, businesses within internally within HKS to be able to provide a better um, PM dashboard or project management dashboard. So um, we are looking at multiple ways to kind of integrate and holistically provide an overview of the business to be more profitable. So from a construction standpoint, it's, it's twofold really. One, we try and keep a finger on the pulse of the industry and kind of see what you guys are doing and what, what new technology is coming out. I mean, I get emails every day of some new technology, some new software, some new process that comes out. And it's, it looks really sexy, right? You want to go buy all of it. But the flip side of that is we have to figure out what we want to actually apply to our construction projects. Because you can get really caught up in that world of I want to buy this, I want to buy that. And then you go and try and shove it on your job sites and nobody knows what to do with it. So we try and approach it from a different standpoint and say, let's talk to our superintendents, let's talk to our job sites and say, what are, what are your needs? You know, what are your challenges? What's keeping you up at night? And then we go and try and find the technology to support that and support those needs because otherwise you're going to run down this road and go buy a drone because it looks really cool and then try and shove it on your jobs and they're going to be like, I don't know what to do with this. Whereas if they have a need and say, I want to go figure out how much dirt is in that pile over there, then you've got to find that technology and figure out the actual solution and the software, and then you find a way to apply it to a job site and test it and figure out, does it make sense for the company? Does it make sense to apply this in all of our jobs? So that's kind of the workflow that we've figured out. And over the years, I've stubbed my toe doing it the wrong way by buying all the technology and doing it the wrong way and trying to figure it out. So a lot of this has come from 15 years of doing it badly and figuring out this is the really the right way to apply technology from a construction standpoint. Thank you. Yeah, sure, and I'm coming kind of on this uh, from the other side, so I'm not adopting new technologies. I'm honestly the guy peddling them. So, um, Rita, you mentioned like user needs, and uh, sorry, David, you mentioned uh, things that your construction managers are looking for. Um, so, so what I'm kind of doing is 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 looking at it from two angles. One angle is what does the actual user want, and what does the actual person who's in a purchasing power want? Who is the manager that's driving the use of this application? And it's an interesting position from my angle where I'm kind of balancing the two. You know, at what point do you say, you know, I'm sorry, users, I would love to add this feature to the, uh, the code map, but you know, at the end of the day, the, the guy who's buying this is looking for these uh, features. So it's a very interesting role kind of looking at it from you know, those two uh, sides. So yeah, that's about it. Okay. All right, I, well, just David, back to you a little bit. What technologies from a construction standpoint are you seeing that are really uh, taking a taking a foothold and, and really r taking off for you? Um, I would say that the three major areas that really at least seen a lot of technology advances over the past few years are reality capture, so laser scanning and those kind of technologies, um, drones in general, and then what's what I've started calling extended reality, which is you know mixed reality or virtual reality, augmented reality, that kind of fall in that bucket. But at the end of the day, all, all these technologies are really just allowing us to do something we used to do a little bit more quickly. 
Like a laser scanner is just a really fast tape measure at the end of the day, right? Augmented reality just gives us a better way to render and look, look at things differently. So it's, are they really that innovative? Maybe, but they are, you know, if you apply them correctly and use the tools appropriately, they can really change the way that you do business. So those are probably the three main ones I've seen. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to read Ian to Mac, you know, from your end, you talked a lot about efficiencies around what, what obviously there's BIM, but what other, what other efficiency technologies are you, are you seeing in your workplace that really, you know, suppliers, vendors can bring to, to you that would help you today? Um, so we also use a lot of VR and uh, AR, so that we use it in two folds, internally for our designers to be able to immerse themselves and figure out what uh, issues we are having for design coordination with our consultants. So we'll, we'll have a multi-collaborative meeting between the designers and let's say the MEP and the structural and figure out where the clashes are in real time and mark those up in real time, provide reports so that we can assess them and fix those issues immediately. So those are some of the tools that we feel are going to enhance the way we work, um, as well as on the future aspect of once the job is complete. Uh, we're not there yet, but I think uh, capturing uh, information on how the project is being operated and uh, what are the areas that uh, can be improved in the future projects? Uh, that can be something that we would like to see vendors provide us with more like sensors that we can um, take data from and understand at a design level what else we can do to en enhance the uh, the functionality, not just of the, of the flow of the uh, design, but also how it affects the, uh, the human factor. Uh, how uh, healthy can we be within that space? So, th and that's some, something that I'm very passionate about to understand how our spaces can provide better health benefits to people living in them. Yeah, and, um, you know, for us, we, we, we are seeing on our construction space a fair bit of reality capture being utilized, kind of site intelligence, if you will. Um, you know, what Reedy was saying. I think you know the, the this next wave of of seeing actually how a building is functioning in live real time uh, is going to be important for our business. So how are we treating the building remotely, if you will? How is that it feeding information back to design teams in order to improve a building? You know we're seeing a lot of use of image or data for asset identification and condition assessment. So you know you're there, we're going to see an influx of lidar data coming from connected autonomous vehicles over the next 10 years, and, and that data is gonna be, you know, uh, collected hundreds of times a minute on every block in reality, and so it, it's gonna be in a very aggressive and attractive way to, to assess changes in assets in our urban infrastructure, right? And, and uh, so it's, how do you manage that data uh, is, 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 so we're, you know, I think that's what we're seeing, and, and, and frankly what we're starting to invest a little bit in is how do you use these sources of data, whether it's images, whether it's uh, satellite data, whether it's LIDAR data, whether it's sonar data, uh, and, and then extrapolate engineering knowledge from assessments, right? So, you know, you see a lot of BIM, uh, you know, that, that vertical or that construction industry uh, has, has been quicker to adopt or has been earlier to adopt seeing that in the infrastructure space, which is kind of AECOM's home. Real in reality, water, transportation, uh, energy, uh, that's that to us is what we see next coming. So I think it's interesting when we talk technology, uh, we, we're talking a lot of efficiencies, which is which is great. But I think the other thing that comes with the word technology and the efficiencies comes cost and adaptation or speed of of the technology. I see you know, you know, in my personal walk, I see that those, the cost and the, the speed of which we adapt these new technologies, I think from a standpoint, this industry isn't exactly like the telecom. We're not putting out a new cell phone and we have 60,000 people standing in line. You know, our, our vitality indexes are a fraction of what an Apple, a Samsung's are. So what can we do to speed up adaptation and s incur Yes, a little bit of cost while doing that. You know, it's funny. Um, I don't know if this will make us, you know, startups in the audience um, or Michael feel any better. But, 
you know, it's not any easier internally. So there, there's, there's, you know, even for us, uh, you know, as kind of an in-house incubator, getting our own employee base to adopt, you know, you'd think that'd be really easy, and it's not. Um, so it's a great question. Um, you know, you are speaking to an audience. I mean, I think, uh, Michael, what you were saying earlier, you know, you, you are talking to a user base. And I, and I say this personally, I'm talking to a user base, but I'm also talking to a buyer, you know, a business that has to return an investment in technology or, or a new way of doing business, both how it, the uptake and the learnings. So, you know, it, it is really, um, you know, it, it, when it comes down to it's talking to the person with the pain, the super maybe on the job site, for example, or, or you know, the, 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 the MEP engineer that's designing it and convincing them how it's saving that one individual time and then how it extrapolates into a larger part of the business. The only way it's going to scale. You know? I'll, I'll echo that. If I found that if you find a proponent that's not you selling it to sell it for you, that goes a long way. Yeah. So speaking of the superintendents, you find one superintendent that's going to use that drone or that scanner or that technology and they're the ones pushing it and they're talking to the other supers and saying, hey, you guys got to get this on your job because this is making my life so much easier. It's not you selling anymore. It's them pulling it and everybody else wanting to be a part of that. Yeah, and on that note, I mean, what the industry's been used to is the uh, a typical siloed, fragmented uh, paradigm. So you have traditionally uh, an engineer who's designing a building. You have the contractor who is bidding and ultimately building this design. And um, each one of these parties is very isolated with their uh, incentives and objectives. So with uh, new evolving build building technologies like integrated project delivery, IPD, and design build, we're bringing these teams closer. Uh, lines of communication are being opened up where people want to work together. Uh, people want to adopt each other's technologies. Consulting engineers want to use the technologies that they can then push to the contractor. So I think the way that we're working together closely is going to allow adoption. I mean, if you do look at some statistics of uh, the construction lag and productivity, I think that right now we're at 1% compared to the global industrial average of 2.8%. You know, just upping that percentage by one percentage point is $100 billion a year of uh, reduced uh, efficiencies, or sorry, reduced cost. So it is interesting what's going on in the industry now, and I'm, I'm fairly excited to see what startups are doing, myself included. Uh, so, yeah. So yeah, um, internally within HKS, you know, we've got pretty much, not only HKS, any, any of the industries, I think there's like two realities. Uh, you know, there's the lingering legacy practices versus the um, new ways of working that are fundamentally shifting how we even put buildings together. So, you know, where we have the traditional construction processes of the project delivery being in phases and then delivering our uh, documentation on in 2D versus getting some uh, prefabrication and uh, uh, prefab uh, models being exported right from our Revit models to be put in place on site. So those are some of the things that if we educate all of us internally and externally to understand that there is a huge benefit in terms of the overall project delivery, we might be able to make some change in terms of um, adoption. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, one thing I'll add, um, you mentioned cost. You know, how, how, do you, how do you consider the use of cost in order to get a, a new technology adopted? And you know, I'm sure you know, it's, uh, a startup will uh, bank on the need for some, you know, terminology may be different, but some pro bono pilot el a fa phase of deploying their new technology, right? So a way to get that out there may be a, a offering to a user, uh, you know, some free use to, 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 to entice and to get them to, to, to try it out for the first time. And, you know, what, what we've learned internally and, you know, what I, 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 I'm, I'm constantly preaching is that's, that's right, probably, and, and that is, you know, it's, uh, it's naive to think immediately the demand will be there, but to pay. But, uh, you know, the, the other thing is, the key is picking that right pilot, uh, you know. So uh, what we've seen a lot of times is that first technology or that first kind of opportunity to, to deploy, take whatever job that kind of was willing to, and it's not a perfect fit, you know, it, you ended up wasting, squandering that investment and, and kind of that exposure. So. It's not only kind of recognizing that there's going to be some cost to sale, but it's also, you know, there's a little bit of patience to look for the perfect project, maybe not the perfect project, but, but the right one that you know it'll be. And so, and even don't be shy to say that to your user, like this is the right project to deploy my tool on. Don't try and force it into something early because, um, you know, it's, it's, you got that one opportunity, so. When it comes to scaling, I, I'm sorry, I'm just going to ask you a quick question. Um, 
do you look for willful adoption on the floor before you go to scale to, to more projects that you guys are using, or do you just say, guys, we're gonna we're gonna use this for this project, you know, we'll f we'll get feedback and then we're gonna continue to use it uh, for. I mean, personally, at AECOM, you know, being a big company, you'd think it'd be the office opposite almost. We don't mandate well, like we don't say you're gonna use this tool. Uh, uh, so, because you know, it's there's a variety of internal and external reasons why we don't. So no, we, it's, it is more organic. It tends to be more organic grand lev ground level where at a, you know, a project team will uh, 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 explore a new tool, see successes, uh, and then it'll scale through the business kind of organically in, in reality. Okay. I'll let go of that as well. We're a much smaller firm, but we don't, mo I've tried the mandating route and it does not work. People will do it begrudgingly and they'll check the box, but they're not gonna actually want it and be passionate about it and help share it. Whereas if you do it the right way and you get those proponents the right way, they'll share it themselves and right. be like wildfire. Right. But you can think about the, the, the draw to the other side for, for like the, particularly at size, you know, when you see the efficiencies, you know, it'd be interesting from an equipment, even from a Schneider's perspective, you know, they could say the same thing, but from, a, from, a, from an equipment and, and a process perspective. But, you know, when you see the efficiencies in a particular tool in one team, you know, the, the natural inclination is to say, okay, I've got 17 of those teams globally. Like, I just need to then force it. And it, it's, it is not as, it doesn't work. You know, it's, it's tough to do those through a mandate. It really. What about even if it's for early innovation, if you guys are internally developing a product and you're saying, hey, I need feedback. I need you guys to use this. I need to get some sort of. We're, we're just as, we're just as, it, it's interesting. We're almost less, we're almost having a harder time with an internal investment because it's like, well, why didn't, you know, I do it this way, you know, this, it versus an external. Uh, so, but, but anyways, the, the short answer is it's the same. It's the same. I have to find a few select users that I know have the need and then push organically outward. So I, as you guys are talking uh, and answering these questions, you know, Mac, we, before we came up on stage, I, we were talking about technology a little bit and how our $50,000 cars seem like they're much more technically, logically advanced than our $50 million buildings are. Um, and then you guys are talking about some of the things that you have seen. So let's talk about maybe some war stories, some past experiences that, that, that we've all incurred around pushing these new technologies, the good, the bad, the ugly uh, about some of those. So I'll, anybody you want in particular want to start? And, you know, and I think that's part of what slows our, our adaptation. Just like you said, word of mouth is probably the best resource to gain access. It's also the best way to ruin your access point because of a bad project. So. I'll start with a negative. <laughs> just, to set, just to set the stage. Um, I think that I've always been really interested in new technology, and I've wanted to adopt things immediately, which can bite you in the foot if you're on that bleeding edge and you do something that's way too soon. It's a really cool idea, but if, like you said, if you have the wrong pilot, it's going to fail ultimately. So I get really excited about when, I, when HoloLens first came out. It was this really cool technology, but the first thing my supers did was, well, it's not, it's not accurate, so I'm not going to look at it. So uh, they had to completely shelf it, and I lost all faith from these guys because it just wasn't where I needed to be, but it was really cool from my standpoint. I, I could see five years from now where it's going to be, but they couldn't really picture that. So maybe adopting things way too early has been something that I've had to learn over the years not to do. You know, you want to buy that first thing as it comes out. Let it gestate a little bit. Let it get some traction. Let them figure out how the software and all the kinks work out, and then try and adopt it. Um, I'm going to talk about a little on how we've already made the huge leap from CAD to BIM, but Sometimes it begs the question whether we implemented BIM incorrectly. Um, you know, it, it, we started implementing BIM with the notion of doing everything in 3D, and it's all 3D geometry with a little bit of parameters here and there to uh, make certain buildings or rooms larger or smaller. Uh, but I think if that were to be looked at as implementing the eye before the geometry, then we would be actually talking about what we need to create in terms of information and then pipe it down to project delivery in a way that we only document or construct enough information that is required by the contractors. So uh, sometimes we see a kind of an over modeling effort or sometimes an under modeling effort. I think the whole, um, we've just basically digitized the um, 
drawing process that architects used to do before. So now we're looking at using more of the information aspect and uh, taking all the information that has been pro pushed into our Revit models over the past uh, number of 10 plus years and then creating more of a database uh, to understand the trends and the um, uh, best in class design ideas that we've output as a firm. So um, going back to implementing new technologies, it's, you know, and war stories, I've definitely faced many of those when um, I was also early enough to kind of say, hey, let's first talk about the I and what do you need in this project? How do you see this kind of figured out before we actually draw and model things in, um, in Revit? and then also have the ability to kind of combine the two by pushing the information to our models and then having that information pushed out to the consultants or whoever else is uh, on our project team. So there are a lot of issues in terms of making sure that what we think in terms of people who are ahead in technology to our larger uh, group internally and externally. So we do have to be careful about how we express that. Um, and how it is adopted. I mean, I guess uh, in my experience, I could say the biggest thing I've noticed was, you know, when you're, you know, Eric Reese from the Lean Startup quotes, like, the company that's the best fit to get feedback is the company that's most likely to succeed. So, you know, it's all about getting feedback for us. So under that design, um, I kind of went the route of saying, you know what, I'm going to create a whole bunch of tools, a ton of features, a ton of content, and, uh, and I'm going to go develop this, deploy it to my uh, user base. And I spent a whole lot of time doing this. And what I found out was I was really playing with two key ing ingredients when I was deploying a product. I had, on one hand, I had time and money. And on the other hand, I had perception. And uh, so after this whole period of time, you know, I developed the product, deployed it, and I got, you know, very little feedback. Everybody went into it and said, you know, there's content all over the place. I don't even know where to go. Like, unfocused feedback. And I, what I realized is that this whole reservoir of perception that I could, could have been spending. Um, and on the other hand of the spectrum, you have somebody that says, you know, I'm going to deploy this thing way too early, and I'm going to, you know, give the users the sh shell of what the application is going to be. Maybe there's a whole suite of features on the roadmap down the road. They're not going to be aware of them. And what happens, the user looks at it and says, you know what, this isn't as exciting as I thought it was going to be. You know, this, the initial launch is kind of, it's dulled down. So what we find is there's kind of a heavy balance between you know, perception, spending that perception resource, and spending your time and money to find the middle ground. My biggest failure was you know, spending too much time and money on uh, developing that initial feature set. Do you have a question? Oh, very good. All right, so uh, I think we're coming <coughs> up on the, the time frame. So I guess uh, last question is just simply, you know, what, what's the one takeaway you would like each one, give you each you know, 30 seconds, one minute, each tech takeaway for the audience to, around technology adaptation, bringing it into this industry and moving this thing forward, on on the behalf or suggestions of of your background. For me, I mean, um, you know, this is uh, not not rocket science, but you know, know the space, right? So where we've had troubles when we were adjacent to a space and we thought we could innovate into it. Uh, and so if you don't have the knowledge, if you really do not, you're not speaking to a user or you don't, you are not a user yourself, make sure you've got a user on the team. Like you've somehow gotten a, you know, because that, that is, I mean, what Michael was saying, uh, over, uh, over creating or under creating and missing the mark, it's, uh, it's because maybe you're, you didn't understand the user uh, as well. So that would be my point. one piece of advice. Um. In short, I think there's a lot of areas that can be improved. Um, we're early in terms of adoption, and uh, there's tons of automation and optioneering that we can uh, benefit from. So definitely reach out to our industries and uh, f let's figure it out as to what it is that we want to innovate together on. Yeah, I think we've all said it repeatedly here. Just listen, listen to who your customers are and don't develop something in a vacuum thinking you understand what they want. Constantly get feedback, constantly ask these questions and help 
course correct because if you get so far off track, it's really hard to really get back. But if you get that constant feedback, you can nudge things here and there and really get back online with a product that ultimately you won't have to sell because they'll be asking for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I agree with all of you guys. Uh, same, same sort of uh, thing. I mean, I guess for me, again, I'm, I'm going to mention how integrated project delivery is going to kind of change things. So on the lookout for me, your question, to your question, I'm really excited about how, you know, these things are going to be, these tools are going to be uh, yeah, just getting more integrated together with uh, collaboration. That's it. Yeah, I, th I, I mean, for my, my two cents, it's exactly the same thing. The more that we work together across the whole value chain, and then, you know, in particularly across the independent sections of those value chains, because the value chains are large, and then they each have their own uh, personas and sections on it. And because our industry is very much segmented, siloed, we've got to bring those groups together. So that's it, I believe.